church and our online family and friends. Thank you so much for joining us on tonight for Bible study. The, our scripture tonight will come from Galatians, the third, the second chapter, in verse number 20. Galatians 2 and 20. And it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loves me and gave himself for me. I'm going to read that again. That's Galatians, the second chapter, the 20th verse. And it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Our song tonight is Jesus is Real to Me. to the next pericope. I want to talk about the three people that Jude talks about as he closes out the pericope that ends in verse number 11. Amen. Amen. Jude, in the back of your Bible, right before the book of Revelation, you'll find the book of Jude, verses 11 through 16. I want to emphasize some things in verse number 11. We were talking last week about some of the, the crooked prophets. 
some of the false prophets. And just as Jews had false prophets in his day, we have false prophets in this day. So Jude sets out to make sure that we understand as readers that these false prophets are ungodly men, that these false prophets have practices that must be exposed, and that these false prophets has no true nature, but they do have a true destiny. And their destiny is not one that we brag about, which is heaven. Let's look at um, verse number 11. He says, woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. We know that Cain was disobedient. Cain despised the worship that God had laid out for him. Cain was envious of his brother. And Cain hated to the point of becoming murderous. Cain had a murderous spirit. Cain was envious of others. Cain was disobedient in his worship. So Cain decided to worship in his own way. And because he worshiped in his own way, disobediently to God, because he was envious of his brother, then he became a murderer. So, so he compares, Jude compares the false prophets to to Cain. Says false prophets have these same tendencies. These false prophets carry themselves just as Cain. They are so selfish. They are disobedient. They don't worship properly, even though it looks proper. Even though it sounds proper. Their hearts are not in it. So he compares these false prophets to Cain. The second thing he says, he compares these false prophets to the error that was made not only by Cain, but he also compares them to Balaam. So Balaam was one who, who, who worshiped under the guise of God. He, he was an imposter. He, he posed as if he was on God's side. Balaam, Balaam posed as if he was a good guy. Have you ever seen the, the, the suspense movies where, where they pose as if, if they're on the right side when they really were undercover um, Imposters, they, they pose as police officers, but they really not. So Balaam, Balaam was under the, the guise of serving God. Balaam was under the guise of doing things according to God, doing it God's way. But really, Balaam was encouraging people to sin. He was pushing them and encouraging them to go against God, but he he act like he was for God. He was encouraging people to sin. He was encouraging people to do crazy stuff. And he did it on the godliness. False prophets, Jude says, these false prophets carry themselves that way today. Another thing about Balaam is that he was seeking monetary gain for himself. He was out there, he was about that dollar for it. He was about the dollar. About that. In the 70s, there was a song that said it was the almighty dollar. About that dollar. Whatever he did, he wanted to get paid for it. And he set his price. Who was it in the New Testament in the book of Acts that, that thought he could buy some Holy Spirit? Who was it? He wanted to buy the Holy Spirit. He, he saw the disciples walking and blessing people and healing people. And he thought, he thought that the, he could buy him some of that Holy Spirit. Who was it? Simon, Simon the Sorcerer. Simon the Sorcerer thought, 
Oh, look at what they're doing, I can do. How they handle things, I can do it. I'm going to just buy me. Why don't you sell me some of the Holy Spirit? Can you buy? Can you purchase? Is the Holy Spirit for sale? Is the Holy Spirit he for sale? He's not for sale. He, he is the triune God. He's the third person. So, so Balaam had, he was about that dollar. He was greedy for money. And he led others into danger by his actions. And people just followed him, not recognizing the danger they were going into. Jude says tonight that even the false prophets that we hang out with or we see or we come in contact with, they just like that. They want the money and they lead people the wrong way. The third person is Korah, Korah with a K, it's pronounced Korah. Now Korah led a revolt. <laughs> he, he, read, he led an insurrection. That word has become popular since last year. He led an insurrection. Korah led a revolt against Moses and Aaron. He did not acknowledge God. He did not respect authority. So whatever Moses said, whatever Aaron said, he would lead the people the other way. He would always have something to say. He would always say but. He would always say however. He would always say consequently. You don't really have to do that. You don't really have to do it that way. What does that remind you of? You don't really have to do that. The serpent in the garden. He said, you won't surely die. I know God told you that, but you really won't surely die. The serpent in the garden said that what's going to happen is your eyes going to become open and you're going to be a God. You're going to be able to reason like God. So Korah, Korah led this revolt. He didn't, he didn't respect leadership. He didn't respect authority. He led a rebellion. And, and Jude says that this rebellion wasn't just against Moses. It was also against God. Because when God places a leader in authority, he represents God. And when you rebel against that authority, you don't rebel against just that authority, you rebel against God himself. The results was swift judgment. The result was to destroy them quickly. Matter of fact, Jude says this, and when he says that, he speaks in past tense. He said they were punished in the rebellion of Korah. They were punished because Balaam looked for profit. They were punished because Cain was led by this rebellious spirit, by this spirit of enviness, by this spirit of sin, by this spirit of murder, because he didn't worship God the right way. So are we worshiping God? Now, let me ask you a question. When he say worshiping God the right way, does he mean that we worship him like Jehovah's Witnesses? Does he mean we worship him like Baptists or Methodists? Is that what God's concerned about? When he say worship him the right way, what is he talking about? Is he talking about worshiping by what we do, how we carry ourselves? What is, what is, what is he talking about? Somebody other than Sister Davis. Worship in spirit and in truth. That sounds really good. That's biblical. Mm -hmm. What does that mean, though? Right. Worship him in spirit and in truth. What does that mean? Right. You're right. In John chapter 4, Jesus says to the woman at the well, the woman that had six men, had had six men in her life. One of these days, you're going to come to Jacob's well, and, and you are not going to appreciate Jacob's well as you do now. Because one of these days, you're going to come to the conclusion where you have to worship God in spirit and in truth. Somebody was about to say something. I was, I was going to say, 
By being obedient to his word. By being obedient to his word. Do we worship him in a way that's not obedient to him? No. Does this Bible contradict itself? No. You're sure? <laughs> Why are you so sure? You sure about that? Hmm? Well, what if I read here, it says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. And then it says, money answers all things. Is that a contradiction? Those are not equivalent statements. They're not equivalent statements. Okay, so what, well, tell me what that means. What? Is the Bible contradicting itself? No. No? For the love of money. For the love of money. So it's okay to have money? It's okay. It's all right? Well, you know, people have believed for a long time that if I'm, if I'm poor and broke, I'm going to heaven. How many of you believe that? McGill's hands up. You believe that? It's been a long time since I've read that verse, Pastor, but in some translations, does it say for the love of money can be the root of all evil, or does it say it is the root of all evil? Well, either way you look at it, it's the root, right? No, it can be. It, it can be. If you, if you handle it the wrong way, it will be. For the love of money. Does money move you? Does money motivate you? Let me ask you this question. When you go to work, what do you expect? Anybody? You expect money? You don't expect chickens and dogs. We used to give the preacher. When we took the preacher, now McGill knows what it means when he say take the preacher, right? When we took the preacher, he would come and he would eat there and then he'd take food with him. But now if the preacher shows up, he doesn't even have to show up at your house. Guess what the preacher wants? Chicken. What does, the chi what does the preacher want now, McGill? He wants that money. <laughs> Is there a problem with him wanting that money? You ought to support the preacher. So, if if the preacher went out to preach and came here to preach on Sunday, and you give him him a roaster pan <laughs> full of food, I mean turkey gravy, whatever it takes, is he gonna be satisfied? Maybe we ought to try that. You think we ought to try that? We ought to try that. How many of you all want to try that? Let's take a vote. We don't vote, but we'll take a vote on that. We'll take a vote. What would happen? What do you think would happen if we tried that? If we gave him a roaster pan instead of an envelope, depending on who the preacher is, right? <laughs> depending on who he is. Some of them would take it and go on by their business, wouldn't they? Might not come back. The story is told, a true story, a true story is told that a preacher preached a revival. And when he finished the revival, the deacons got together and got all the coins from the revival together. Put them in a brown bag. Didn't bother about counting, just dumped all the coins in a bag and, and gave the preacher the bag and said, yeah. What do you think about that? And the good thing about it is the preacher never mentioned it to the pastor of the church. He just took the coins and went on home. That probably wouldn't happen in the 21st century. So it's okay to have money. You ought to have a lot of money. I told you on Sunday, until the Lord delivers you from gambling, delivers you from the lotto, just give God 10 to 25 to 50%. People say, oh man, I don't want that dirty money. Every piece of money we take in is dirty. That's, right. That's why we say, Lord, bless it in the name of Jesus. Yeah. And when we pray over it, we don't say a long prayer, do we? Because the fact of the matter is, money does answer all things. You got a light bill, money answers. <laughs> so the Bible never contradicts itself. But this guy here, they wanted that money. 
And when you put money above godliness, you have a problem. When you put money above godliness, you have a problem. And God has a problem with you. But look at verse number 12. These are the spots in your love feast. They oftentimes, they oftentimes had love feasts geared to giving God the glory and celebrate God. They would celebrate God. They would have what we know today as annual days. We pretty much gotten rid of the annual days out. Why do we get rid of annual days? Anybody? Well, let me ask you this way. Why did you all want to get rid of annual days? Give me a reason. Give me some reasons. Anybody? Hmm? <laughs> she said, Pastor David didn't want to have him. My, my, my. Who else, who else was talking? <laughs> why, why did you want to get rid of annual days? Uh, after a while at where I came from, mm -hmm. I wanted to get rid of uh, annual days because it just turned out to be a mockery. It wasn't. It was a mockery. Okay. She's not talking about this church. Let me make sure everybody understands. She's not talking about this church. She's not talking about the church I came from after 55 years turned into, I mean, even having a dance, a Zodico dance. Ooh, good. And, uh, so it just turned into. Uh, Ooh, those, that's what y'all angry days look like, Zodico. I mean, they had a, a key Frank dance. I see. Uh, well, sister, I think Sister Woods and I probably know where you came from. We're not going to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> brother, brother, brother Whitlock. What is an annual day? What is an annual day? It's, it's a certain day of the year you have every year, the same day, same time. Let's say. Celebrations. Like our, our anniversary, the church anniversary was an annual day. It's the third Sunday in March. The pastor's anniversary is the annual day. The pastor's preaching engagement annual day. But those annual days, the usher's day, annual day. Men and women day. Now those days was packed out and they were in the evening time. McGill made a lot of money videotaping. Annual days. I mean, we kept his lights on with annual days. Because they had annual day, whatever you think of. I used to, as a young preacher, I used to preach in the seven, whatever you wanted to be, it was seven. Seven last sayings. The seven, now it's gonna get, it's, you, you're gonna say, what? Seven last sayings, the seven seals, the seven bowls, all those are spiritual. Then they had the seven ingredients to the holy cake. They had the seven boxcars on a train, the holy train. These were annual days. And these annual days, we really, I mean, you had seven preachers and a moderator. And people would come out in groves for these annual days. And they would, and they would celebrate God. And they would really hear good preaching. And the choir would sing like from heaven. And people's hearts would really be turned toward God. But it turned into something like Verse 12 says, he goes from verse number 11, talking about Korah, talking, talking about Balaam, talking about Cain, and all the things that they were about. And then he says in verse 12, these are spots in your love feast. While they feast with you without fear, they had no fear of God. Serving only themselves. It turned into a mockery, Sister Darrington, because they began to serve themselves. Whenever we have a worship service, it ought to be geared towards serving God. Whenever we have a worship service, it ought to be geared toward giving God the glory. But these annual days, these annual feasts, these love feasts, now it's supposed to be a love feast unto the Lord, it turned into a love feast for themselves. 
because they lived like Cain. They had the attitude as Cain. They lived like Balaam. They had the attitude as Balaam. And they lived like Korah. They began to worship themselves. Then he classifies them four different ways according to nature. Look closely at verses 12 through 16. He says, first of all, they are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead and pulled up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the dark, the blackness of darkness forever. Let's talk about it. He says they are clouds without water. They are clouds without rain. They are clouds that are useless. Because when we say there's a cloud in the sky, we're not talking about there's a cloud in the sky because there are clouds in the sky every day, right? When the Bible says, there appeared a cloud in the sky the size of a man's hand. It's not talking about it's just a blue, white cloud there. It's talking about a distinguishing cloud, and this distinction of this cloud has rain in it. He classified these, these false prophets as clouds with no water, clouds with no rain. They are useless. He says they have clouds. They, they come to the love feast, first of all, and they eat meals, and they eat and give themselves edification. They build themselves up. They are really puffed up. It's a love feast that was geared toward God, but they got into it and they, they geared it toward themselves. Let me tell you, man can mess up anything. Man can mess up anything. And let me just tell you, sir, if you notice, not just preachers. If you got a group of mechanics, there's, there's one that can mess up the whole thing. If you have a group, group of electricians, there's one that can mess up the whole thing. Some of the rules and regulations that the city of Houston have that we complain about now and cities have throughout the world is because one person did not do the right thing and then that person created a whole mess for all of us. So the city says, okay, from now on you can't do this because one person didn't do it right. So they created another rule. They created another permit and it could cost you more money. And all it takes is one person. Who was it that said one bag after spoils the whole bunch? Hey, hey, hey. Who said that? One bad apple spoils the whole bunch, girl. One bad apple. One bad neighbor can mess up the whole neighborhood. Right now, there's a, there's a neighborhood near me that that, that the neighbors are trying to get one person, one, one household out of there because of drive-by shooting, because of, of police officers having to come through all the time, because of killings. They're trying to get them out the neighborhood. All it takes is one. And one person, as it says that Cora did, one person can lead all these other people astray or make life miserable for everybody else. So Jude said, that's, that's just what false prophets, that's what they do. So, so he says that they, are, they have no fear of God. They are clouds with no water, carried about by the wind. They are clouds with no water, and they are carried about by the wind. The Bible teaches that you need to study to show yourself approved that you may not be carried about by every wind or doctrine. And let me tell you, the false prophets sound good. The false prophets tell you things that are good, that make you feel good. In the name of Jesus, I declare in the name of Jesus, 
I declare in the name of Jesus, when you get up in the morning, you're going to be filthy rich. But see, what we have to understand, the prophets of old, when they prophesied, they didn't prophesy all good things. The prophets of old, when they prophesied, they said, in the morning, your head will be detached from your neck, and the birds will eat out of your neck. But see, we got modern day prophets now, they want that money. And so they got to tell you something good. And so what they do is they, they listen, they watch, they look at your, your mannerism, they can see when you worry. I mean, they're experts. And they ask you a question. Now, if, if you're a prophet and you, you know all about me, why you got to ask me questions about me? How many children you have? Is it two boys or two girls? Oh, you got two boys and two girls. I feel in the spirit. That child you worried about, that child you've been concerned about, is going to be all right. Now, how many people have more than one child that don't have to worry about any of them? So did he tell me anything that's, and then if you check, you know, children go through things. So guess what? He, he hadn't prophesied anything. But people flock through coliseums. Just for this. They're just clouds with no rain. They just carried away with every wind or doctrine. They are just moved by stuff. And when they move by stuff, they have to understand, as Jude says, these men are crafty. They are slick. Matter of fact, Jews says they have snuck in unaware. They have, they have come in. Have you ever seen a, a lizard? How many of you have seen a lizard? Just one time or two. If a lizard gets on your leg, guess what the lizard does? Change color. It changes color. I know if a lizard gets on one person's leg in here, I mean, good God Almighty. <laughs> I mean, we'll have to turn, turn. I hope the video cameras are rolling if it ever happens. We're going to get $110,000 from that one. If the video cameras are rolling and a lizard comes through here on a Sunday morning, let me tell you something. We can, we can, we're going to win. America's funniest video, America's home video, American church video, we're going to win that one. Pastor Manuel Fletcher, when he, he had the church over off South Maine, they were just worshiping and going on, and all of a sudden, the raccoon fell out the ceiling. <laughs> and Joanne Dealworth was in the service. She should have been here anyway. She should have been at the New Beginning Church. A raccoon fell out the ceiling. I told her he should have run up her leg and up, her, up the side of her neck. She should have been at her home church anyway. So when Pastor Fletcher was telling me about it, I said, Pastor Fletcher, were the cameras rolling? He said, no, they weren't rolling. I said, oh, man, you should have had $100,000. Raccoon dropped out the ceiling on this side, and they did the wave. <laughs> I mean, he said he was standing up preaching, and all of a sudden, the whole left side of the congregation, woo, they did they, they did the sweep like an offensive line. <laughs> now, you know the camera should have been running. I mean, they did a sweep. I mean, people that was on cane left their canes. <laughs> people that said they could not walk, they could not run, they ran that day. Now, that's when the Holy Spirit hit. I tell you that the Holy Spirit doesn't hit you. That's when the Holy Spirit really hit. I mean, people ha that hadn't waved their hand, that, that hadn't said amen, in 20 years got up and ran. I mean, a physical, breathing raccoon fell out the ceiling. Lord, I can see it. Can you see it? Can you believe it happened here? Oh, Lord, I hope it doesn't happen here. Because it may be more than the wave going on here. It may be some heart attacks. 
You better get him. You better get him. And then these are people who are big and bad now. They'll punch you and me out. But guess what? If a raccoon or a lizard shows up, you better get him. So what has happened is these false prophets, Jews said, they have camouflaged themselves. And see, this is why you can't judge the pastor by what he does. I've said to you several times, I've said to you several times, if I do something that's out of my character, it's because I have given several warnings. And it's because I've talked several times. Because we've had preachers come here that tried to sneak in unaware. But let me tell you, I'm like a watchman on the wall. The Bible says I am the watchman on the wall. I am a watchman on the wall. And I can look the devil dead in his eye and tell him, no, not here. Gone down the road. And what they do, they come in and they can get the hearts of the people. And they can tell the people all these sweet things. And guess what? They never discipline one. They always encourage you and tell you how good you seem. They always tell you how, how beautiful you are, how well dressed you are. I didn't say all of them that, that encourage you are those that are false prophets, but I am saying False prophets have an agenda. And we've had several of them just stop in. I mean, they're preachers. And they last for a while. And y'all talk bad. Pastor Davis ain't going to let no preacher stay around here. He always running them off. But you don't know like I know. I got a story to tell. That's why God made me to watch me, not you. For he watches for your soul. He watches over your soul. For he's the one that makes the difference in your life. Yeah, I put my britches on the same way you do, but you're not called to be the watchman. I'm called to be the watchman. I told you last week, I love the fact that I'm called to be the watchman. And while I'm here, I'm going to be the watchman. I'm not going to let you get me in trouble with God. Just because you decide to talk. Pastor Davis ain't going to ever let a preacher come here. He run them all off. Well, you don't know why. So Jude points out the fact that they are, they are apostate and they are crafty apostates. And they moved into the church. Jude points out the fact that they go to the love feast and they eat up the food and they celebrate themselves instead of celebrating God. He even talks about the fact, and the Apostle Paul talks about the fact when they show up for, for communion or the Lord's Supper, when they show up for the Lord's Supper, they don't eat the Lord's Supper as God would have them eat it unto them, unto him. They'd rather eat it unto themselves. Paul says, you all come to the Lord's Supper, and when you come to the Lord's Supper, you know what you do? You, you glad. You come and you eat a whole meal. See, their, their communion is different from ours. We got a wafer and an a, a, a eighth of a glass of juice. <laughs> they had whole meals for this communion. But some folk did just like people do today. They pack away all that they don't eat there. And then they look at me and say, Pastor, I, I'm taking mine away because I'm saving mine. Yeah, what, what about the one that you just dropped down? Or the six you just put on your car. So that's how they were doing it. They were, they were misusing the communion, misusing the Lord's Supper. They were false teachers. They were outwardly showing that them showing themselves to be godly, but inwardly they denied the Lord Himself. Late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead. In other words, what he's saying is. They were trees, but they bared no fruit. So they were dead while they were still in the ground. When it talks about twice dead, after they died, then they pull them up by the root. Now they're twice dead. They are twice dead. And because they are twice dead, they will be judged. It says, it says they participate as if they are, they are real. This is where we get the word blaspheme. They, they, they imitate godliness, but they deny the power thereof. 
the false prophet. Now, why would you spend a whole book to repeat all this stuff and to tell us this stuff that other prophets have already told us throughout the word of God because he's given us a warning that in the 21st century, these men will show up and this thing is real. It is real. It is real. They have made their way to into the church to misuse the church. They are really intruders. They secretly do things. And they attach themselves to the believer's heart. And many times they can sing good. They can preach good. They can teach good. They can speak well. You look at Acts chapter 12. You find Harris standing up. I think it's around verse 21. The Bible says Harris stood up on a day and he gave a great oration and great speech so well spoken unto the people said this is not the voice of a man this is the voice of a god and the bible says the worms came and ate up his body because he did not give god the glory had the wrong motives he was an intruder when he used the word spots these are blemishes these are, are wrinkles these are stains He's saying that these qualities that they have are nothing more than stains. All of us have some stains. All of us have some problems. But these leaders, these are leaders in the church and they're just dragging people down the drain. They have stained themselves and now they're trying to stain everybody else. They are, they are late autumn trees without fruit. And in the autumn time, that's when you're supposed to be pulling fruit off the vine. That's when the tree ought to give up fruit. That's when, that's when it's harvest time. You know, people walk around now, the thing that they say, oh, it's harvest time, it's harvest time. Because we have plant during the year, and now it's time for us to harvest. The problem with that is people think that at harvest time, you sit down and just be blessed by God. Now, I'm from back home in Mississippi. At harvest time is the hardest working period we ever have. You think you worked hard to get it up. At harvest time, you really work hard because you don't want it to rot out in the field. It's harvest time. So people walk around here talking about, oh, it's harvest time. Yeah, it's good as harvest time. You're going to be blessed during this harvest time, but you got to go get it. Because whereas you've been waking up at 6 o'clock to get it planted, now you're waking up at 3 o'clock to get out there before the dew comes off the ground. It's harvest time. But see, the false prophets will tell you, oh, it's harvest time. You can take life easy. How many of you know there are some prophets that will tell you, this is the year of Jubilee. And then next year, this is the year of Jubilee. And the next year, this is the year of Jubilee. And so what I say is, I thought you said last year it was the year of Jubilee. You telling me that you cramming 50 years into this one year and then it's the year of Jubilee again? False prophets look. Every year in January, they claim the Lord has told me this is going to be the year of Jubilee. This is going to be the year of your harvest. This is going to be the year of your blessing. When it's harvest time, you got some work to do. You have work to do. So, so they, they give off nothing. They're twice dead. And then you, they get pulled up by the root. Verse 13 says, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame. Raging waves of the sea. If you've ever gone, Galveston is identical. I mean, Galveston is a perfect example. Have you ever gone to Galveston and the waves come in and this big bubble of foam just sit there and then the waves go back out? Then the waves come in again and leaves this foam. Now, in Galveston, it leaves sticks, bottles, foam, and everything else. So what, what he's saying is these guys who are false prophets, 
they have their own little foam that they love. And the foam is not real water. Foam. Matter of fact, foam messes up stuff, doesn't it? You shake up a soda water, what do y'all call it here? Pop. You shake up, we call it pop. Y'all call it soda water. You shake up a pop, it fizz, and it pops out and messes up the place. Okay, let me get something that you can relate to. Okay, your champagne when you when you open it, your champagne or champagne, it foams and you don't drink that foam, do you? So what you have to understand is these guys who are false prophets, they are just like foam. Good for nothing. Even the fish can't live in this foam. They're good for nothing. Foaming up their own shame. They are putting themselves to shame. They are wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. These guys, they are, they are shooting stars. They are wandering stars. They are stars that shoot across the air. And when you live in the country, you can see the stars real well. And when you see one that's shooting across the air, it's there for a moment, then it fizzles away. It gives off no light. It's just a shooting star. It's a wandering star. It has nothing to do with anything that will be sustained. The stars that sit in their sockets, they, they light. They set off light. They give off light. But a shooting star just goes across. And, and children used to stand out in the country and say, Oh, look at that. There's a shooting star. Because they were rare. And when they, they came, they just shot across the darkness, then they fizzled out. So these guys who are prophesying and they are, they are false prophets, they are fit for darkness. They are fit for the blackness of darkness. And it's reserved for them now. They, they are not spiritual. They have no spiritual fruit. They want you to believe that they have a spiritual root that can give off spiritual fruit, but they neither have the root nor the fruit. And it says, for darkness forever, they will face darkness. They will face Judgment forever. Verse 13. Dark. Verse 14. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his, his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all, who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds. Look how he's, he's going to use ungodly four times. Which they have committed in an ungodly way of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Wow. Just, just plain old ungodly. He said it's, it's, it's going to come a time that they're like, like the waves in the seas are like shooting stars. Judgment is going to come. Then Enoch has prophesied. You know the Bible as we have it is, is canonized. It's 66 books. It's been canonized to 66 books. And there's something that's known as the Apocrypha which includes the 66 books and other books that were not canonized into our Bible. One of those books is the Book of Enoch. The Book of Enoch, here Jude quotes from the Book of Enoch. And as he quotes from the Book of Enoch, he's saying Enoch was the seventh from Adam. And he says that Enoch's prophecy points out Christ's return. His return will be a glorious return. And when he comes to earth, there will be thousands upon thousands of saints that come with him. And those saints are coming to judge this world. 
And those false prophets will be in line to be judged. These false prophets will not be around Christ's throne judgment. The great white throne judgment is what we call it. Some may call it the Bema Seat. These prophets will not be around the great white throne judgment, but they will be around judgment that will cause them to hurt from now on. Darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Enoch says, these men and women will be judged. Look at what he says. He uses, he uses the word ungodly. They will, they will be, there will be thousands upon thousands who are saints. They will come to execute judgment on all. To convict all of what they have done. The ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds. So the ungodly people will be judged according to their ungodly deeds. Which they have committed in an ungodly way. Even the way they did it was in an ungodly way. In all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now they're speaking against God. They speak against Christ. And they will be judged for it. And he warns us that we, know, we do not follow this. He, he tells us, don't follow this. There's a new religion that comes out every day. There's a new one every single day. There's a new one. And all we have to do, and Pastor Booker and I talked about it today on the way here. Pastor, Pastor Booker and I talked about the fact we got to get back to the basics. We just got to get back to Christianity. We have to get back to following Christ. Because as we put labors on people and people put labors out there, those labors lead you into other stuff. Check this out. I'm a member of a non-denominational church. Well, non-denominationals, non-denominationists, they have tried to get away from denominations. But don't you know that non-denomination is a denomination in itself? They are so close to Pentecostal. They are so close to Kojic. They are non-denominational. So they suggest to us that they are non-denominational, meaning that they don't claim a denomination, but non-denomination is a denomination. So be careful of the labors. Don't be fooled by them. These apost apostate leaders are short-lived. They go and they come. These apostate leaders will find themselves at a point in their lives where they will be judged, they will be convicted, and these apostate leaders will, not, will prove to not be true spiritual leaders. They stand against God. As a matter of fact, they deny Jesus Christ himself. They deny Christ himself. Then he, he, he labels them. He says in verses 16 through 19, he, he calls them grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lust. In they, in they, in they mouth great swelling words, in their mouth, they're a great swelling word. They're flattering to what people. They do it all to gain an advantage. Verse 17. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 18. How they told you that there would be a be mockers mockers in the last time or the last days who will walk according to their own ungodly lust. Verse 19. These are sensual persons, sensual persons who cause division, 
not having the Holy Spirit or not having the Spirit. Central mean they're just worldly. They just act like they're spiritual. They know when to shout. They know when to talk. They know when to weigh their hands. But they are ungodly. And the Bible says they have snuck in on a way. It says to us tonight, don't be fooled. They are only doing it to gain an evil advantage. An ungodly advantage. But those of us just have to simply believe the story of Jesus Christ. Of his death, burial, and resurrection. The fact that he died, he was buried, he rose again. Let's just trust that story to get us to heaven. Let's trust that story to fulfill us. Let's trust that story to make us whole. We don't need another doctrine. Let's stick to the 66 books. Just that if we can get the 66 books down, if we can obey God the way God would have us obey him, we can get it right. Don't be fooled by any wind or doctrine that comes along. Because men will tell you anything they want to tell you. And they will do anything to make you think they, they are godly. How many of you remember the leap of faith? The leap of faith, I think it was Dean Martin in the leap of faith, he, he did tent revivals. He went from one place to the other doing tent revivals. And he came out of this town that had not had rain. And he promised them rain. And uh, they found out that he was a crook. And so he was praying, and, and there was a little crippled boy there. And he was going about healing people. But what was really happening, he had an earbud in his ear. And the lady in the booth would tell him, the lady in the third row has not walked in the last 20 years. And he would go get the lady up, bring her up front, stand up out the wheelchair, and she's healed. But every single person that he healed in, in the crowd were people that were planted in the crowd. So his wife would just tell him, uh, his, his, his commentator would just tell him where the people are located. They already made deals with him. He was making a lot of money. Until one day this crippled boy walked up and he looked at the blood of Jesus streaming down his side. And the little crippled boy started walking. And the preacher was surprised. Because the symbol of Jesus is a movie now. Because Jesus heals without man. Jesus allows us to pray and people get up, but Jesus is the one who heals. So as they ran him out of town, he was riding in his truck, this 18-wheeler, and all of a sudden rain started falling. And he realized that because he was sincere, God answered his prayer. But he had messed up so many lives prior to that. Don't believe the fluff. Don't believe the foam. Don't believe the trees with no fruit. Don't believe the waves that, that come in and go out. Steadfastness is what God's looking for. God is looking for somebody that will believe God just for who he is. Don't believe in every wind, wave, or dark. The door of the church is open. Imitations extended. Trust Jesus as your Savior. The door is open. If you've not believed that Jesus is the Son of God, and out of obedience unto God, He gave His life as a ransom for you, this is your moment. You can trust Jesus today. Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, and you will be saved. If you haven't trusted him, trust him today. I want you to enter into this little prayer with me and invite Jesus Christ into your life. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins.
I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. We believe that you're now born again. We believe that you're going to heaven. We believe that Jesus has welcomed you home. And there are others of us who struggle with obedience, struggle with support and leadership, struggle with rebellion. Let us pray. Father God, we come asking you to forgive us. Bless us to be obedient. Bless us to move beyond our selfishness. Bless us to live righteous. Bless us, Father God, to obey you. We ask you to remove our arterial motives. And bless us to be about your will. We give ourselves back to you, Father God. We yield unto your Holy Spirit. We pray that you bless us now. That we will be missionaries that will tell others about the goodness of God. That we, Father God, will tell other people about this Jesus that we serve. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory all the honor and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank God. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us here at the New Beginning Church, 4251 Shiremai Road, Houston, Texas. Thank you so much for joining us. Please come and visit with us for Sunday school on Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock. Come and visit us on Sunday morning at 1030 for our worship service. And please come back again to visit with us on Wednesday night at 7.15 p.m. to hear the word of the Lord. If you want to give to our ministry, you can do so electronically by giving by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com is our Zelle account. If you want to mail in your gift, you can do that by mailing your gifts to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Again, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being with us tonight. Please come on Sunday morning at 9 and Sunday morning at 1030. Thank you so much. Father God, we thank you now, Lord, we bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. God, we thank you, Father God, for your word. We thank you that we don't have to be tossed to and fro by every wind and dark. Lord, we ask you, Father God, to, to bless us now. Keep us now. Bless us, Father God, to be a shining beacon light for others to see. Bless our lives, Father God, that our lives will be whole and be turned toward you. Lord, we pray for our youth and our young people. We ask you to keep them safe. Bless them, Father God, in times like these. Heal them. Strengthen them. And bless them to keep focus. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling. Unto him the only wise and only true God. Unto him be power, be glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing together. Amen. Amen. God bless you and God keep you. It's our prayer.